We can put our heads in the sand and ignore reality, but in the end, it's going to come back to bite. In this video, we are going to talk about something that hasn't happened for a hundred years. The information I'm going to talk about today is only for those who seek the truth and for the vast majority of people, quite frankly, they're not ready. I'm going to show you this because I know that you can handle it. How does that sound? In today's video, we're going to look at not only just this one fact, I want to show you what's going on out there in the post inflationary world that we can see. And I think it's going to be devastating for millions beginning right here. You could see Canada's making the 90s real estate bubble look like affordable housing because the prices have gone so astronomical, unaffordable when compared to wages, unaffordable on so many different scales. Right now, Canadian real estate is off the charts. So I'm trying to show you in one aspect that inflation, when we talk about shelter, you got to have it, can't ignore it. Shelter is one of those that's just really feeling it real hard right now. People are uh, real burning about that. And we got to understand where inflation comes from. Of course, that's the expansion of the money supply. Now things are changing. U.S. money supply is doing something not seen since the Great Depression, and it may be a signal of a big move to come for stocks. That's what they are saying, okay? Because historically, we don't get these circumstances of a declining money supply without a bad thing happening. Now, at the same time, what I like to interject here, I know the videos that are out there that will get all the clicks uh, on these titles, but I want to tell you the full breakdown, okay? If you're willing to accept it. We had such an extreme surge in the money supply leading up into this moment. So if you see it over a, let's say, 10-year time frame and sort of level that out a bit, it's not as extreme. And so the, the, the rise and the fall that we have now been dealing with is sort of just, you know, continuing on with this extreme expansion of debt and monetary easing and all of that, okay? So I just wanted to make that very clear that, okay, yes, it is down, and I'll show you the percentages and why this is important, but look at where we're coming from. We're coming from, you know, coming around a few years ago, this was, um, you know, this just, just massive, unbelievable surge where 40% of all the currency was printed in, what was it, two years or a year? That just, that just it shocks the system. Now that it's coming down, we are nowhere near where we were uh, coming around from 2020. Okay, so just, just I just want to make it real for you. I just want to give you the actual information instead of just shocking you all the time and people don't understand and they feel lost after. Well, I want to show you the truth. I want to show you both sides. And that's really what this is all about. But they're not going to go anywhere with that. We know the currency supply is going to expand over time. We just don't know when that change is going to be in the other direction. And as this starts to come down more and more, it creates more problems, more dislocations. Remember that banking crisis? Oh, yeah. What about $200 billion in losses that haven't really been exposed yet? I'm going to show you that in this video as well. Take a look here. You can see that the money supply as related to M2 has fallen by 2 a percent or more only five times in 153 years deflationary economic downturns were the end result of the previous four instances and so that's what a lot of people are talking about they're talking about a massive deflationary spiral that envelops the whole financial system that's certainly possible right but will the federal reserve allow that to happen they can certainly stop that if they devalue the currency dramatically they will Household savings collapse sparks recession fears among economists, not just economists, but of course, a lot of people. You could see that this has declined even in a historic basis, even on a percentage basis, like you look at it from different angles and, and it is in fact coming down quite a bit. You can see the personal savings rate was estimated to be around 4.6%. This um, is basically after people's income what do they have left over and that's that's what that means okay so after their expenses their income comes through what's left it's not necessarily like savings in the bank uh and so we know that inflation is taking a toll that that's all it means okay inflation is taking a toll wages are not keeping up 
we got a problem. We got a big problem, in fact. Inflation has hidden costs that go beyond higher prices. Consumers need to allocate time, effort, and funds to planning, budgeting, and shopping. Do you see that? So now you got to go to six different stores. You've got to shop at the dollar store instead of shopping at Walmart. We are looking at people buying in mass bulk together, which I think is a good idea. Mass bulk together to get that discount that they simply couldn't with one family. And so these things go on and on. And I, I think it's important, of course, to address what's happening here, and that is permanent entrenched inflation. So the money supply is coming down, but at the end of the day, the central banks and the government want to, they're, they really, really desperately want to devalue the currency. And how do I know that? Well, we've heard them say it so many times before, including Ben Bernanke's speech in 2002. Households on high incomes are not particularly high risk, are at a particularly high risk of sinking under a mountain of debt. And it's interesting, even the people that are considered to be high income earners are dealing with the same problems. And the whole point here is that it doesn't matter how much you make, you're going to spend to your absolute most. That's what happens. That's the reality of the circumstances. People get a raise at their job. Oh, I know. I'll buy the latest BMW. Oh, people get a raise. They're going to buy the pool. People get a little bit of an inheritance. They blow it all. I've seen that before. What about somebody getting a little bit of inheritance and suddenly ah, there's, there's a real big problem because I noticed that they were going to the casino uh, every weekend and uh, they don't seem too happy now. Oh, that's right. Because they blew it all. Really, really terrible. Okay? And there's no difference, by the way, between those going to the casino and those speculating on any, any type of other uh, asset, in my opinion. I'm talking about speculation, not investing. Here we go. You can see it for yourself. Bank of America nurses $100 billion paper loss after big bet in the bond market. Some more than double the cost to other U.S. lenders that channeled, uh, channeled flood of depositors to deposits to cash. So there is an issue here. You can see Bank of America. There are others, by the way. Uh, it's all the big names. Citigroup was in here. Um, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. They're all here. And uh, they've taken on some big losses right now. Bank of America is bearing the cost of decisions it made three years ago to pump the majority of a $670 billion in deposit inflows in debt markets at a time when bonds traded at historically high prices and low yields. So they weren't getting that return just like SVB. It's the same scenario kind of with SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. They kind of had a big problem here. And now we are getting this right smack dab in the face. The moves left BOA, the second largest U.S. bank by assets, more than $100 billion in paper losses at the end of the quarter. The sum far exceeds unrealized bond market losses reported by its largest peers. And so here we go. You got the savers coming in. That is like short-term stuff, and they're investing in long-term stuff. So imagine you're, you're a bank, you're taking in all these deposits that has to be readily available and you take that and you throw it into long-term investments. But then everybody says, I want my money back. They start pulling their money out and now you got all that long-term stuff. You can't make up for it. So this creates a problem. They were taking losses on this and uh, that's unfortunate for them and their shareholders, let me tell you. So we'll see what happens. I think this is uh, still... A crisis that is unfolding before our very eyes. The bank crisis is very real. And of course, during these times, contracting money supply, tightening financial conditions, all of these things, one by one by one, will of course impact their bottom line. Here we have it. Central bankers were slow to respond to the surge in inflation in the EU, the UK, and the US. So those charts are in that order. All I'm trying to show you here is the light blue area, which is the inflation and the dark blue is their Fed funds rate or equivalent, okay? So every case, they're always so late on doing this. Always, they do not deal with inflation properly, and this is the result. You get it entrenched. Had they done it earlier, had they started to, instead of saying, oh, inflation's transitory, they should have been dealing with it properly. Higher long-term interest rates impose large losses on the banks that 
hold them. This is just connection with that. And I'm just trying to show you what's going on today. These banks are in trouble to a different degree, depending on the bank, depending on the circumstances. But in general, higher interest rates has been a problem for them. SVB was one and there are others, and I think we're still going to feel those losses through 2023, especially with the commercial real estate that has been a significant problem and will actually be just as bad in 2023 and uh, 2024, based on what I've seen from the numbers. And now we have this issue that's pending here because a lot of these countries are losing faith in the dollar. They can't use the dollar. Their currencies are so weak compared to the dollar. There are different reasons. And now they're just basically saying, we don't want the dollar anymore, or we're not going to use it anymore, or we want to diversify. There are now 41 countries ready to accept a BRICS currency. In August, on this channel, I will be bringing you all the details as it comes out when there's this whole BRIC, BRICS conference. So if you subscribe to the channel, I'll bring you all that. Uh, let just hit that button down below. Now, I wanted you to know this because we can see the world changing and there's a multipolar world that is being developed. And so what that means is you might have the SWIFT system and the US-based financial system. That's, that's one thing. But on the other end, you might have another system that runs entirely independent instead of we all use the SWIFT system, we all use the US-based system. So we're going to have these two separate systems, maybe three or four separate systems. And that means ultimately that um, one country could do business in these other systems. And that would suddenly change things a lot. It, it really doesn't give the U.S. a monopoly anymore. And um, I think that will kind of swing the balance of the strength economically of um, the United States as, as well as the other countries. Uh, so I would just be aware of that and understand that, you know, if these inflationary pressures are entrenched and we have these problems, that's going to hurt these developing economies really, really bad. Okay, so they've got to change. It's not like, uh, you know, we we want to, in a sense, they have to. And so we're going to get this other system that's being developed right now. And perhaps the bricks are going to be the core of that. We will see as it um, as it happens. I just want to tell you also that you've got to get out of debt. And that's what this video is all about. Get out of that bad debt. I give you 10 tips to get out of debt. Click it and I'll see you there.